Hi, this is your host Supil Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Dan Bartholomew, co-founder and CTO of Section. Dan, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Since you're also a co-founder, so I am also curious to know the story of Section, uh, why you created it, um, what problem you are looking at solving for the larger you know, ecosystem. Thank you for having me here. I'm really pleased to uh, speak to you about Section. Um, Section was born out of a, um, a combination of frustrations that I had and my co-founder Stuart McGrath had as we were building some large-scale e-commerce websites. Um, what we found was we were relying on hosting companies to provide us with servers to run our software. And we also found that um, we needed to use content delivery networks in order to manage the performance and scalability of our websites. And, um, Stuart and I have always been early adopters in agile and continuous integration and continuous delivery platforms and um, methodologies. And what we found as we were starting um, at building that e-commerce website was that there was a really big disconnect between um, what was happening in cloud and what was happening in content delivery networks. And we, we found that Clouds were providing a superior degree of flexibility for us to build and run our software, but content delivery networks always seemed rather rigid in their design and what features they had available. So Stuart and I, after identifying this disconnect between what CDNs were doing and what cloud was doing, we set about building um, a system that would have the networking properties of a content delivery network in that it's massively distributed. Um, however, we also wanted people to be able to choose what software they actually run inside the points of presence. Um, so what we ended up building is a large distributed compute platform that allows people to bring whatever software they like in the form of a, uh, of a Docker container and have that run across all of the different pops inside Section's network. So if I look at a Section platform, what exactly it is, because what happens in most cases, uh, and uh, I think you folks kind of predates even Kubernetes that in these technologies, uh, when they start, they start off with solving one problem, but with the, of course, the market, the with the users, you know, own evolution of their own workload, the platform itself evolves. So if you look at uh, Section today, how would you define the platform today? Section today is a distributed general purpose workload system. It's probably the most, uh, is the least words I could say to define it. But, um, but you're exactly right in that kind of history um, as Section um, started out, it really did focus on tackling CDN-style problems in that uh, we started out with uh, caching, uh, content caching capabilities, and then we added web application firewalls, we added image optimizers and uh, bot blockers and A-B testing and virtual waiting rooms, things that you would normally see inside a CDN. Um, but uh, as Section was developing each one of those modules, the, the caching or the web application firewall, we built it inside a Docker container, and that allowed our customers to actually choose which CDN features they wanted by selecting different containers. So instead of a rigid design, um, it's actually a composable design uh, for, uh, for each customer's CDN needs. But because we were um, just using Docker containers to do that, Section in its current form actually exposes our entire network to our customers as though it was a single Kubernetes cluster. So what that means is now I could go and choose Section's CDN features and, and compose them together but I can also build my own applications 
and actually deploy them in into section. And the way I would do that is exactly the same as the way that I would deploy any application to a single Kubernetes cluster. So, so under the hood, each one of our points of presence is a unique Kubernetes cluster that we uh, that we run for our customers. However, we run a, an overlay, uh, basically a virtual Kubernetes cluster that our customers interact with that actually orchestrates the underlying physical Kubernetes clusters that are running across the globe. Um, some examples of where people are using us today are um, because of our strong origins in e-commerce, uh, we have customers that are building Node.js type applications or GraphQL and React style applications. And instead of running those Node.js or GraphQL components in a hyperscaler, they're actually lifting and shifting those containers out of um, hyperscale environments in, and actually running them in section. And the way that we facilitate doing that is because everything in section is now Kubernetes based, all we do is we ask our customers to say, instead of targeting this single Kubernetes cluster that you have, update your tooling to point to sections Kubernetes API, and then we'll be able to distribute your container across the network without you making any changes. Um, and the reason that they do that is by uh, generally for user experience and scalability uh, improvements. Um, by moving their software closer to users, they're actually able to uh, dramatically impact the uh, page load times of these e-commerce websites, which for those businesses in turn it, uh, relates to increased conversions. Now I will talk about some, some uh news announcement that you folks made at the end of January, uh, of course, uh, support for scaling Mastodon and also uh, persistent uh, volume storage. Uh, talk about uh, these two. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, why specifically Mastodon at this point? And of course, uh, we can talk about the persistent volume storage as well. Mastodon is readily available in a Docker container. Um, and it's actually easy for people that want to create their own online communities using Mastodon to uh, join Section and ask Section to run the Mastodon Docker container for them. The, um, another, um, uh, now you would be able to do that on a platform where you were running that uh, on a single data center. You could spin that up in a hyperscaler, for example. But by doing it in section, again, the user experience times uh, are improved because we're able to run the Macedon server close to where the users are. Uh, in, in fact, um, what section, what, one of section's strengths is a core technology that we call the Adaptive Edge Engine, um, which dynamically moves the Docker containers around the network depending on where the users are. And this has a great benefit for, for all of our customers because instead of deploying Docker containers in one or two or 10 data centers and having them always on um, depending on when traffic comes, um, that increases the cost. Now, what Section does is we continuously monitor where the users are coming from. And then we find places inside the Section network um, that would best suit those users. And that means that you don't need to run the containers in locations that are giving a, um, a suboptimal cost benefit ratio. Maybe there's not enough users um, in Europe in the middle of the night to warrant running a container there. So Section will continuously detect where the users are and move the containers uh, to those locations. Um, so um, that's um, 
um, that core technology, the adaptive edge engine, is actually really important. It, um, it allows, um, because of the way Section builds its network, um, we're actually able to easily make uh, Docker containers run across multiple hyperscaler clouds or be a multi-data center uh, without any heavy lifting from our end users. The second thing that you asked about there was um, our recent announcement for persistent storage. Um, uh, given Section's origins in performing CDN functions, Section has for a long time uh, only um, supported what we call ephemeral state. So that would mean state that the application is able to lose um, and that we could restart it. And that was really important for us to be able to move the containers around the network. Um, however, um, we had a lot of um, feedback from customers that they really wanted to be able to have some local storage inside our points of presence. So what we've recently enabled for our customers is inside each point of presence, we make available to each customer's workload a shared disk. And that means that all of the containers that we run inside a point of presence have access to this shared disk. And it's kind of useful for containers to be able to share information between each other. Um, it can be used as a database backing store so that you could run a distributed database. And it is um, also useful for just general uh, uh, operations that uh, Kubernetes performs on containers, which is scaling them out so that uh, when you get a new, uh, a new container, to, uh, when you're scaling out, it already has access to all, the, uh, to all the state that the other containers may have created. And also uh, in the case of when a container crashes and K Kubernetes automatically restarts the container, the container can pick up from where it left off without having to do any state management. I also want to talk about something a bit different, which is, uh, of course, we talked about announcements, uh, something which is contemporary as well, uh, and that can be a couple of things. First of all, as we're talking earlier, that you folks predate uh, a lot of these cloud native technologies like Kubernetes. Uh, talk a bit about what kind of evolution uh, are you seeing in the space in terms of, uh, I, I know, first of all, it was all stateless, then it became stateful workloads. And then even uh, the reports, you know, that Kubernetes adoption is growing beyond its, you know, general uh, use case. So what are you seeing in the space and how is kind of section preparing itself to address some of those use cases? Yeah, um, what we um, what we are seeing is that um, uh, maybe, maybe a couple of different things. Um, firstly, we, we're seeing um, the need for um, distributed workloads that are not HTTP based occurring more and more. Um, CDNs and especially CDNs that have um, serverless function capabilities have been um, targeting servicing HTTP workloads. Um, and, uh, but what we're seeing is um, customers are coming to us saying, um, we, we have this piece of special software, it doesn't use HTTP, it uses a TCP protocol, and we really wanna get it distributed, but we don't wanna build all of the anycast networks, any of the DNS infrastructure and have to run, you know, 20, 50 uh, points of presence. We just want to build our container and deploy it and have somebody look after that. Um, so we are seeing um, a drive in non-HTTP protocols, um, which is something that um, Section is uh, aggressively pursuing at the moment. Um, we're, um, but Going back to the concept of the adaptive edge engine, one of the key motivators uh, for us designing and creating this technology is that as we see um, the uh, market for edge computing grow um, and we get many, many more locations, um, what is needed here 
is a computational approach to deciding where and when to run the software. And that is exactly the problem that the Adaptive Edge engine tackles. So if we take a little example here, um, let's say um, a, a large um, US ISP um, makes available racks of servers across um, you know, 100 or 1,000 locations across the US. If I'm a developer and I say, hey, I've just built this fantastic container and I want to get it as close to my users as possible, um, I don't want to sit there and say, I would like to run in Denver where I am and I'd like to run in, uh, in this city and this city and this city and I'm willing to pay for uh, four instances of my container in all of these cities. What I really want to say is I would like a programmatic system to move my containers uh, to a place where I might say, I would like to be within 10 milliseconds of 90% of my users. That, that is my directive. And that is the goal that um, Section's Adaptive Edge Engine um, is trying to solve um, in that we, we don't want to physically nominate exactly where our containers are. We want to we want to um, state our intent and then have the system manage that for me. I mean, if you just look at you know the current situation in the market, um, depending on how you look at it, uh, a lot of layoffs are happening. Companies are looking at uh, even cost the cloud. They look at the cost. They are looking at cost cutting. So talk a bit about what are the trends that you are seeing and how section makes companies more cost efficient. Market segment that um, section is really driving into at the moment is um, operating, the, uh, operating distributed compute networks for customers that build um, uh, platforms as a service. Um, so say for example, um, we, we see a lot of great API technology emerging at the moment. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of adoption of things like GraphQL in the market, and a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the people that create GraphQL APIs are looking to improve the end user performance by becoming distributed to overcome some of these speed of flight problems. And um, however, they don't have the operations capability to run a large number of clusters. And that comes from making sure that they're healthy, making sure that they're patched, making sure that there's no security vulnerabilities and doing all of the penetration testing across that network. And um, another thing that um, we see is uh, going to your point on the skills base, um, we also see that some um, of the um, advanced networking uh, capabilities that you need to do to build this kind of system are actually really hard to obtain. Um, so what we, um, when we encounter people that are trying to build things like section in-house is that they um, take on both a, a, a big um, innovation burden in the, the need to solve a lot of these um, uh, problems around networking and cluster management, but then also just handling day to operations for basic things like Anycast, DNS, Kubernetes clusters, um, the consistent failures uh, that you have across a large network are really not in their core skill set. So by allowing, um, allowing these API specialists to, um, to work within the areas of which they have fantastic specialization around creating GraphQL APIs and things like that, and then providing them a, a developer and operations experience that is the same as running a single Kubernetes cluster, we're able to um, give them the benefits of having all of this distribution um, without having to do all of that operations uh, operations work. So um, I think that that is a, a really key driver that allows our customers to, um, to innovate, to stay um, ahead of performance um, uh, that you might see from uh, hyperscaler offerings 
um, without taking on the burden of having to uh, train a team, obtain that, obtain that skill, and, um, uh, and keep maintaining that. Dan, thank you so much for taking time out today. And of course, uh, talk about uh, section, your story, and also, you know, uh, share your insights on where the market is heading and the ecosystem. Uh, I love that. And I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much.